Mm. And so now I'm teaching him how to do that. And so it's like really exciting, right? So there's there's so many amazing things happening. We I closed a fifty thousand dollar deal while we're in Thailand. That was such a fifty crazy... five zero. Five yeah, zero. fifty thousand dollars. We were in Thailand. It was like one point seven million Thai baht or whatever, <laughs> which is like more than the average <laughs> Thai person makes in like five years or something. Oh, and then even God. today, FedEx showed up. I just got a check in the mail. So I thought <laughs> it was a his drama. Like what? Trying to surprise me. I'm like a check. So things are happening. We just closed our seventh deal of the year. You know, we don't close the most deals, but we we set our goal to make the most, highest assignment fee, which averages around twenty five thousand. So even our wholesale, our acquisition partners are making five grand a deal. Welcome to another episode of the Wholesale Elite Podcast. I'm Maisham Hipshin. I'm joined by my dude Tanner Santucci. What up, bro? What's going on, bro? It's gonna be a good one. Ah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> guys, today we are joined by, uh, I mean, just people that are near and dear to my heart. Like I, we, this, is, this is the first, I want to say you guys are the first guests that have had a round two. Um, and so Paul uh, Nelson and Michelle Garbito, what's up, my hey loves? Guys, what's what's up? up? Good to see you again. Good to see you uh, guys. So incredible to see you guys. And it's it's so incredible to see you guys in America because you guys have been traveling. Yeah. What's up with that? Since we last saw you, where did we go? We went to Florida. We went to Disney World. We spent Christmas in Disney World. And it was somehow it was freezing in Disney World. Uh, and then we went to Belize for New Year's, which was amazing. Man. Uh, we'll actually talk about it. I actually assigned a deal while I was laying on the beach in Belize. Very nice. And I went to Thailand and Japan for a month, and then now we're in Arizona preparing for our next trip. Incredible! I mean, incredible. It you guys were it, it seemed like you guys were in Southeast Asia for for a little while. Um, yeah, five weeks. Five weeks. Yeah. Oh wow, wow. five weeks. Yeah. That's oh man. I I I I look forward to getting my business on. I say on autopilot, you know, to a degree, uh, to where you guys are, to where I can really, you know, cause I'm a lifestyle guy, you know, yeah. lifestyle dude is my, my, my Instagram. It's, you know, I'm, I've never been money motivated. It's always about the things that money can do for you. And so, yeah. I mean, you guys have been my North star for a long time. So I'm so honored to have you guys back on. I'm like, this is really cool. Um, Guys, okay, so the last time we talked, um, for anyone who hasn't seen um, or listened to the the last episode, I want to say it aired in like the beginning of December, uh, but we recorded it in November. And back then, um, please go back and, and review that. If you guys aren't familiar with with uh, Paul and Michelle, they're they're obviously a dynamic duo. Like they they're crush it, they're crushing it. They're not married yet, um, but that's <laughs> irrelevant. <laughs> so if you're looking for the same name, I just want to give you guys that heads up. Uh, Paul, Paul's last name is Nelson, Michelle's Garavito. But um, yeah, they're just, they're phenomenal people. And I, you know, when I got into the uh, Astro Flipping community last year, um, they had, they were already, you know, they, their business had, was getting traction. Um, you know, they were all, they were the ones who were invited out to speak at our big masterminds that a lot of people would pay money, a lot of money to go to. And I'm like, okay, these guys got it. Um, but then I learned that we we shared a similar past. You know, I I had I came from uh, the industry of network marketing uh, or MLM or you know there's many other words that people can call it. Um, yeah. but, uh, it Paul and Michelle did as well, and uh, they like me didn't have the best experience. You know, with with that industry, and although there are some great companies out there, um, it's just you know it just it just wasn't a good fit. And so we needed to find something that aligned more with our values. And then also something that could provide us a great lifestyle. And so I saw that these guys crushed it in network marketing. Now they're crushing it in real estate. And I'm like, oh my God, there's hope. This is so cool. And so the last time we had you guys on, you, you we talked about the journey. You know, we talked about um, network marketing, the challenges that, that you and Paul faced. I mean, it was just unreal stuff that happened to you guys. And the fact that you didn't let that get you down. You guys were not victims. You were victors. Right. And as usual, you press forward and you found the new thing and you dominated and you, you guys found Astro and you told Jamil just to give a little recap. You told Jamil, Hey, at least Michelle did. Yo, if this isn't real, like I will come find you and F you up. 
So, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's definitely real. Um, and now we're going to move on to part two, where we talk about what's been happening, you know, not even since the, since the inception. Like, we're, we're past that. You guys have plenty of content out there to talk about that. I want to yeah. talk about the success you guys have been having lately. Now, we're oh, okay. a... We're a mindset show, you know what I mean? So we're, yeah. we want to talk stories. We want, I'm going to jump in and ask, you know, maybe a little, you know, deep diving questions about, hey, you know, tell me a little bit more about that. But I, I kind of want to just kick it over to you guys. I probably should give you some sort of a timeline for reference, but I know you guys are used to speaking publicly. So I just, I would yeah. love to throw it over to you guys and kind of pick up where we left off. And let's, let's just kind of start there, if you wouldn't mind. Cool. Yeah, well, the last six months have been uh, quite a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, man, I don't even know where to begin. Where was the last thing we said? From like, what was, what was it the last thing that we talked about? Do you remember? Yeah. I, I, we really wanted to get to you guys' uh, story at the time, but okay. we literally spent probably 40 minutes um, just really going into you know, a warning and almost a cautionary tale of, Hey, anyone who's involved in, in network marketing or MLM, just beware, you know, okay. be okay. Um, yeah. but know that there there's, there's options out there. There's, there's hope out there. Um, and right. so that's kind of where we left. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like hit, like, hit the rewind button. I'm three years. Yeah, it's long ago. If every time people ask us about our network marketing like journey, it really feels like it was another lifetime ago. Sure. Like it's I like always talking about like an ex partner, you know, it's like yeah. that's past. But, but it's yeah. fine, you know. We don't have any hard feelings or um, like we don't have any bitterness towards that journey. We're actually very grateful for that journey. Absolutely. And I guess that's something that we can talk about. It's like the yeah. pros and the cons and the gratitude that we have because of that journey. It just oh, feels absolutely. like feels like another lifetime ago. <laughs> yeah. I, I think as we left, we got to see the dark side of it more and more and realize mm -hmm. that those red flags that we kept seeing and ignoring were real. Right. Um, and that doesn't mean that there wasn't true value there. You know, we learned a lot of skills from goal setting, the time management, to prospecting, to team building and leadership skills. So I gained a lot of skills that if I didn't have that experience, I don't think I'd be having the success in real estate now. Right. And we'll talk about it later, what I'm doing now. I'm applying everything that I learned here, except in an environment that will actually pay me, not in an environment that other people get paid. Right. So we, learned right. The skills. Absolutely. we learned the skills, we, we sowed the seeds, but it was just in the wrong environment, in the wrong company with the wrong leadership. And, and in my opinion, not a real business. Mm -hmm. um, now we're doing it where we're actually entrepreneurs running our own companies and we can apply those skills. So what has, you know... Going from, you know, being in a network marketing company where you don't have, you know, you have a team essentially, but right. you, you have to keep your team happy, essentially. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you, you got to yeah. make sure that it's always roses and things like right. that. So right. to not talk about MLM and to move on to real estate, um, what was the hardest part for you guys in transitioning over into real entrepreneurialism? Mm, that's a good question. Um, well, I guess both Paul and I have different yeah. hardships. We can talk about yours first. Well, for me, I mean, it's so funny. Network marketing, they convince us that we are entrepreneurs, but they're not. Mm. Right. I truly don't believe that. They're independent contractors working for a company, basically as salespeople and recruiters. Um, so being an actual entrepreneur was totally different for me. You know, it's obviously it's much more exciting. And then a year ago when I quit my job, uh, it's very different to no longer have that stable income. And now this is really all on me to make this happen. Mm -hmm. And even in network marketing, I, I always had some kind of other income stream or I didn't need that money, you know, or a lot of times I was investing much more money than I was actually making. Right. Uh, in this case, we're profiting almost every month or almost every month in our business, which is a huge difference for me. For sure. Yeah. I think for me, the hardest part of, um, of transitioning was, uh, not like, not, what's the word, not relating everything to network marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very difficult to like go to events and not think back of like, oh, here they're trying to motivate and encourage and, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very, very similar. True. A lot of the things are very similar. Um, and so for me, it was very difficult to try to like 
not compare, you know, the, the, what we did in network marketing versus what they do here. Um, but for me, I actually found the, the transition to be very simple in, in the fact that I, I already had the work ethic. I knew how to build a team. I knew how to create processes that created results. It was just about doing it in a completely different industry. And so that's one of the biggest reasons why I invested into Astro was because Astro already had the blueprint that I was looking for because I had no idea what I was doing in real estate. So Astro taught me the blueprint and then I just kind of took it and created it into my own thing. And then I, when we started to scale, we already knew how to vet people, how to interview people. We knew exactly what we were looking for. And, you know, back then in MLM, we would have different organizations and which organization would hit what to achieve our goals. And so now we're basically doing the same thing where we have different departments in our business and we're now we're vetting and interviewing different people to put them in different departments that they will grow and elevate and, and grow from their business. Um, but here, you know, we don't really do too much motivation, too much hoorah, too much roses, you know, we're not helicopter mentors and, and we don't, we don't even consider ourselves mentors, you know, sure. we really like to just lead by example, teach people what it takes to make money and let people kind of do it on their own. And we just kind of guide them from there. That's that's powerful and and that's perfect. I mean, it, it makes total sense the the transition over, um, and it's neat that you guys kind of have you know almost different perspectives, but you're you're able to support one another, uh, yeah. you know, moving forward. So let me ask you, um, you guys are are brave, bold people. I've seen some of the, I'm, and we're going to talk about it. You know, it's some of the stuff that's been happening recently in you guys' business. Um, Talk to us a little bit about comfort zones and, yeah. and what it means, you know, to get outside <laughs> of your comfort zone. And maybe an example of something recently that scared the shit out of you guys, but you still <laughs> pressed forward. Oh, my gosh. Oh, let me go first because you yeah, have a lot. You can I have start. a lot of discussion. It's, it's very fresh. So you might get. Well, oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> give it. Uh, a year ago, my company really hit a standstill with mm. the. Uh, market shift. And I was sitting around feeling bad for myself, waiting for things to happen, not making it happen, and just going down this rabbit hole. And, you know, my comfort zone was to just sit there and feel bad instead of doing something about it. And luckily, I've been blessed with an amazing queen by my side who kicked my butt and said, hey, if you actually need to, you have to go fix your company. And so that's when I just there a week later, I was able to sign a deal. I, I, I had 18 contracts that got canceled in a row mm -hmm. because our strategies weren't working. Our numbers weren't working. I had to redo everything and I just wasn't willing to. So in that period, I had to step out of that. I had to get back to what I love doing, which is micro flipping and working with other wholesalers. And that's how a week later I was able to do a deal. Uh, and then from there, I had to revamp. I had to look back what, what was working in our company and what wasn't. Why did we cancel all 18 of these contracts? And one of the things I had to stop doing is working with buyer's agents and start going directly to listing agents, which was very uncomfortable. And I didn't want to have to do that. Uh, and then also I had to let go some people that I was working with. Um, and then we completely shifted to now we're experts on the things that we're doing and it's really, really working. So that was a big one for me. Great job. It's not so raw because it was a good <laughs> 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 but no, it's, it's perfect because, you know, like what he said, you know, when Paul feels overwhelmed, and I'm sure a lot of people do, it's not just Paul, but when he feels overwhelmed, he kind of shuts down. That's and me. so, he, you know, he sits in the couch and watches movies and, and, and YouTube videos. And that's totally fine. It's, it's a, a yellow flag that I noticed when we started dating. And as a woman, for me, like, I call that shit out. I'm not just going to be like, Oh, he's a man of the house. I'm just going to let him relax. I'm going to be like, what the fuck are you doing? Get the fuck out the couch. <laughs> fix your company. Because you're not mm -hmm. just going to sit on the couch and expect deals to come and be like, la, 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 here's your deal. Here's $18,000. Like, that's just not going to work out. We can curse on here. Yes. Oh, yeah. And, okay. and Paul, it, any uh, any regrets on uh, dating a Latina? <laughs> <laughs> I got what I asked for. There you <laughs> yeah, go. you did. <laughs> um, and so, you know, the comfort, the comfortability of just watching movies and chilling and just be like, I don't want to deal with the the growth that, that I need to make and like getting out of right. the comfort zone that it takes and the work that it takes to get out of the comfort zone for me mm. to be able for him to be able to fix his company, whatever that, that takes a lot of work. And after I put some fire up his ass and he fixed it, 
a year later, I mean, Paul has, does less work and makes more money. Just last month, he did thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars. When we were in Thailand, he made fifty thousand dollars and only worked two hour days. You know, he has an incredible team of leaders that bring him exactly what he needs to bring money to the table. And people in his team make five to ten thousand dollars a month working very little hours. I mean, he has college students, other people in his team that have that are flippers and that are successful in their fields, but within his company and the work that he's taught them, they make professional income. Mm. Um, and so that's that's the success that he created getting out of his comfort zone. That was a year ago. And today he's just reaping the rewards of a year later where he's made more money in four months in his own company than he would have made a whole year working at his W-2. And that's that's what he wow. created getting out of his comfort zone. So mm -hmm. I forgot to add that part. Yeah. And <laughs> something else a little more recently is I started working with that Astro Blaster program yeah. Uh, which is doing agent outreach. And that was very uncomfortable for me because I mm. am a believer of who, not how. And I don't want to be on the front lines talking to these agents, getting cursed out, you know, <laughs> waking up to like not so nice comments. Sure. Um, and so, you know, I, as soon as I was able to, I trained somebody to take that over for me. Yeah. Um, so but that, that was a big, uh, uh, very uncomfortable moment for me to have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's Paul's story. Obviously, my my story is a little bit more recent. And by the time this comes out, I'm sure everything will be more announced because right now I just shared it with the Astro community. Um, but a lot of you guys remember that obviously I had an acquisition manager who eventually I bumped up to COO of my company. And so we, you know, I basically trusted him to do all things acquisitions. Obviously, there were moments where I would bring on some people, I would train them and then let him lead the team. Um, and so that way I can just focus on the contracts that would come in. So I could just focus on this point. That's, that's my strength. That's what I love to do. I love to just look at the properties, market it out to my best buyers, assign the contracts, deal with title and cash the checks. That's what I like to do. I don't like talking to agents. I rather hire that out. And so as a CEO of my company, I always look at everything. I look at KPIs. I look at team performance. Um, I look at all the small little datas and the pulses of the company. And this is something, again, that I'm so grateful for that we experience and learn through network marketing. We nice. always used to look at the pulses of the business. You know, it before it used to be how many plans were you showing, right? How many people were you talking to every single day? How many people you were sponsoring in the business? How many products were being moved? Like these are the pulses of the company. And so I do the same thing in my real estate business. And that's something that I noticed in March while I was in Thailand, I was looking at the numbers and we had not closed the deal in Q1 through Prosperity Estates. That's my company. I am not going to wait for my business partner to bring contracts for me to close deals. So I have a separate department where I work with my, my acquisition wholesaler, my micro flips. So I was closing deals on the side of my company, you know, through my, through me and my acquisition wholesalers. Some of them were new wholesalers. I needed help with deals. Some of them were wholesalers like Eric Penuelas and so many other people that bring me deals that we close on. And then I was looking and I was like, we were getting contracts, two to three contracts every week. By the time I would get the contracts, the numbers were off. That like, like the the contract mm. numbers did not make sense. Like, I, there was no way I was going to sell them. And so I, you know, I started to get like people. People were questioning me. You know, like this person was asking me, like, "No, you're crazy. You just have terrible buyers." And so the the ego got in the way. You know, and so I basically said, like, if this doesn't change by Q two, I'm gonna we're gonna have to discover. Uh, a different working relationship. That's the nice way of saying it. like you're sure. going to be gone if this shit. <laughs> right. Um, right. So again, I the same thing kept happening, and this was something that was very difficult for me to do because somebody I've been working with for a long time. Many of you guys know this person, and many of you guys know a lot of the, even the acquisition people that I worked with, and I brought on new people. And so I was checking the pulses of the company and sometimes the health of the business. Again, we, we learned this in network marketing. When, when you're not creating results in your company, you have to find the cancer within the health of your business. Absolutely. And unfortunately, the person that was leading the acquisition department for past a year and a half was the cancer in the company. And so I had to cut the cancer, unfortunately. And now my buzz, my business is going through chemotherapy right now. Um, <laughs> and, you know, when you go through this healing process of anything, you know, you have to get rid of old cells and get bring bring forward new cells. And sure. so I've been so grateful for this experience. There's no hard feelings. I love 
I love my ex-business partner like a brother. And so the way that we agreed to it was for him to just start his own wholesaling company mm. for him, to, you know, kind of uh, spread his wings and fly. He knows all things acquisition. Go ahead and learn how to get new buyers and, you know, give me exclusivity on any contracts you get. If I think it's a good deal, I will share it with my network. Um, but unfortunately, so we basically had to split ways. Right. And on top of that, you know, not only was that going on, I just closed our first flip. I shared a lot of the pros and cons on Astro. But one of the pros, obviously, of doing a virtual flip, because I was in th four different countries <laughs> while this flip was going on. I was in four different countries. Um, so that's a pro. You know, I wasn't there managing the day to day, which is a blessing. Um, but one of the th one of the cons that I shared in Astro was right. that I was the only woman in the team of people that we brought on to manage this flip. And so I brought in the equity partner. My ex-business partner was like the manager and his best friend, who's also been our buyer's agent on a lot of deals, was a contractor and the listing agent. Cool. Oh, wow. I always, yeah, I always like to interview people. I like to check, you know, people's um, stats and, and portfolios before we do anything. So I did do that with my equity partner and he did a great job. He funded 100 percent of the profits and all the things. Um, but a lot of the things that I would recommend was not heard, you know, and so I wanted the best of the best contractors that was not heard. They just chose, you know, his best friends, best contractors and the con they had to fire those contractors midway, hire new contractors. Um, this was supposed to be a three month project turned seven months. OK. Ooh. And by the time like that, we went live, I would have agents call me and was like, is this project done? And mm -hmm. it was because there was so much stuff that was still messed up. And every time I would ask, how's it going? What's going on? Do we need to fly down and stuff? It was always everything is great. Don't bullshit me. I'm all about happy, happy, joy, joy. And everything is awesome and positive. But I'm also a realist. Like if things sure. are not going well, tell me so that way we can pivot or we can do something else. So last minute, we had to change the roof. We have to do this. We have to do that. So it ate into our profits. And I, even by the end of it, like we, there were, there were buyers that were backing out and I'm asking for like the updates, nothing came up by the end of it. Paul and I only took home $11,000. Now I'm very grateful for the $11,000, but for a seven month flip, it is not worth our time and it's not worth our energy. And for some people it's like, well, that's a lot of money. But again, we have such high standards on the things that we do that that would did not fit our standards. And right. so after, after that happened, I was like, you know what? I no longer want to work with these people anymore. So even when I asked for the financials of the flip, I didn't get it till like four days later. And I got a stupid screenshot on it. I was not invited to oh the meeting. Yeah, I got a screenshot. Wow. What the hell is that? I was not invited to the meetings to go over financials and stuff like that. The crazy thing about it is that these dudes think it's okay. It like, oh, everything is dandy. Everything is awesome. Don't you worry. The money will be in your account. Like, no, it's not about that. The money was in my account three days late. That is unacceptable. And as a woman that is leading her life with her own finances, like I like to have shit in line. And sure. so unfortunately, I had to let all that go. And so with my experience of having another male kind of take over the most important part of my business, which is lead generation, and then working with a ton of men and a ton of testosterone with this flip, um, it was just extremely evident to me. And again, I feel like I've been ignoring the signs of my vision and the signs of my purpose within this lifetime. And that is to impact, empower and lead women within this industry, because I just feel like a lot of women are just not heard. A lot of women are disrespected. They're overlooked. And they don't, a lot of people don't, a lot of men in the industry don't take women seriously in, in this industry. And I've experienced it. I know many women have experienced it. And so it, I'm so grateful that all this happened because it reignited my vision. And so right now I'm in the process of restructuring my whole company, um, rebranding the whole company. So now it is officially going to be an all woman real estate investment business. Acquisition team is going to be all women. Obviously, I'm the CEO. I'm a woman. And everything we do is we're going to partner up and focus on women-based companies and learn how to figure out how to grow 
a company led by women, owned by women, and teach women how to make good money doing wholesaling. So then we can eventually partner up on really fun projects that we have in mind, like owning land and building new construction and doing flips in a luxury level and a professional level and partnering up with other badass women like Brittany Berriman when we, when we have officially opened up in the Texas market. So nice. we're partnering up with her and having women lead that department as well and just continue to really create noise and really focus on empowering women in the space so we can have a voice and just have a place within the industry. So that's, that's where we are right now. Ooh. That's phenomenal. And oh my God, that's so exciting to hear. You know, yeah. I mean, as a dude, I'm just like, okay, you know, that, that sounds cool. But I, I can only imagine from your perspective, from your point of view, the power um, yeah. that you're going to uh, generate, you know, not just for yourself, but for that whole, um, uh, what, what's the word? Is it sex? Gen, gen, <laughs> what, what's, yeah, gender, gender. I'm so scared to say the wrong thing these days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Canceled. But, so like yeah, <laughs> we're canceled. All of a sudden, our, our screen starts <laughs> melting. Um, but no, the, but seriously, the, I don't. I don't know if there's anyone that that's doing that. And the, yeah. the wild thing is, is that if someone is, and I don't want to judge them or whatever, but mm -hmm. I know your heart. Yeah. I know you don't take any crap. I know you don't take any L's. <laughs> and for you to take the stance of of building an all woman business. Like not only is it going to win, but it's, it's going to change so many lives and it's going to give men a better understanding, hopefully mm -hmm. of the abilities that women have in real yes. estate. Like it's correct. Uh, correct. It's, this is a relationship business. And to, correct. I, you know, Tanner and I say it all, all the time. Like we need, we want women on our team, like our yeah. team currently, there's only four of us. Um, but I don't want to do the whole thing where I was like, okay, we only, you know, look, look to bring on a girl next, but we're definitely like, Hey ladies, like, please, please, please. It's just because th the balance, it's so yeah. necessary. And you, women you are relational. Both. Yes. Women 100%. are relational. Um, uh, another thing that I just wish that I could have had a more voice into is like the, um, the design, you know, we have an eye for design and we have a knack for feeling energy and vibes. And, right. you know, a lot of women like myself, we had to really tap into our masculine energy most of our life. And so, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, to be able to find the strength in our feminine energy when we live in such a masculine dominated world. And real estate is a perfect industry that is an example of a, such a male dominated industry. Absolutely. And so a lot of, you know, real estate agents, when you talk to them, they're a little bit more masculine. They're a little bit hardcore because, I mean, they have to be. They're dominated by men. Their broker, I'm sure, is a dude, you know, whatever. And so it's so important also to have a partner that, you know, brings forth. <laughs> we can Paul say, he's like, that's me. Um, <laughs> hey. I'm so grateful for Paul because he lets me shine within my feminine. So I don't have to take the masculine out too much, you know, um, and vice versa. You know, I give him the space to be the masculine in the house, in the home, in his business. And so don't worry, dudes. Paul has officially opened up a Colorado department for the guys. So, you know, if you want to hey. send us Colorado deal, send it to Paul and he'll bring it to me. It's totally fine. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> it's really, really exciting to just really like really tap into that vision that I've had when I was 17. You know, when I was in Amway, um, that's all I wanted. It was another male dominating industry. And so I was the first single woman at the time to hit these levels. And so that's how I became known was like, wow, there's a single female that just hit this level and did this and has 500 people on her team. And then once I started to prove myself and like really show what I'm made of, a lot of the male egos felt threatened. And so they just try to bring me down until to the point where they completely destroyed me and my business. I have healed and have overcome through that. And now I'm, I'm at a place where no one, no one teared me down. If any, if anything, they just reignited my vision and opened my eyes like, wow, that vision is still there. Like that, that yeah. purpose is still there. And I think a lot of people, and this happened to me too, I was kind of losing the essence of the vision and the purpose in, in, in our business. Like I personally don't like to just close deals and call it a day. You know, I don't like to just make money and call it a day. You know, we like to work towards something, you know, we like we want to be able to like, why is it that we have, why is it that we're wholesaling, you know, why is it that right. we're 
why are we why are we in this is it just to post checks on the astro group is it just to say like oh look at us we're digital nomads and we travel the world and it's like i feel like there's just so much more to life than just that absolutely and so that's really why i'm so grateful for this this whatever, you know, everything that has happened is because it really did reignite my vision and my purpose um, within myself in the real estate industry. And I'm really excited about it. Let me jump in and, and kind of dive a little bit deeper on, um, you know, women in real estate, because I, I yeah. think it's a very important topic that that may get overlooked a lot. And, you know, there's a ton of, of ladies, especially in Astro and, you know, in our community and just in the world of, of real estate alone. What do you think outs, outside of men, you know, uh, holding, you know what I mean? When I say holding back, you know what I mean? I, I just mean maybe not, you know, we're, we're asking you to come in our world. Outside mm. of that, what do you think is the main thing that's holding other women back from excelling in real estate? I think it's just, um, you know, have, you know, when I don't know if you've ever talked to women that have gone through a divorce or a breakup or stuff. And when, I, I don't know why I'm fascinated about these things. I'm fascinated in human psychology. I think I should Likewise. have been a therapist. Like I'm Same. just fascinated by this stuff. And so a lot of my a lot of my friends and acquaintances, you know, they're going through breakups and stuff like that. And I always ask, like, what happened? What, what's going on? And a lot of women say it's just I felt like I didn't have the space to feel heard or to feel mm. seen. And I don't, I don't have a safe space. And I think that's the problem within women in the real, in the real estate world is it's not a safe space for them to be like, no, I'm not doing this or the numbers don't make sense or sorry, I'm not accepting that offer or, Hey, this is a great deal. I think it's going to be for you. I'm going to send you the assignment contract because if women just come at, at, at it like that, they are going to be eaten up. Trust me. Yeah. I have been, up by men in this industry i've gotten cursed out at i've had threats i've had uh lawsuit threats like i've had it all because i'm not afraid to bite i'm gonna bite you i'm gonna eat you up for lunch breakfast dinner and all of the above and so a lot of women they don't feel safe and mm. so i feel like there there has to come a point where more women need to really dive into their internal self and really understand like who they are whose they are and understand mm. who you know like who is in charge here? You know, God Absolutely. created all of us. And so as soon as women figure out like the strength within themselves and their beings, then they will not be afraid anymore. And if we can create a safe space for women to be that, that, you know, that head honcho and be confident, be bold without feeling afraid that they're going to get attacked or looked down upon or pushed aside or fired or whatever, then I feel like it'll be great, you know? And, and, and I can relate that to my relationship. You know, Paul has created a safe space for me to be myself right? because I'm not afraid for me to like, you know, be myself and be afraid that Paul won't like me anymore, that he's going to break up with me, that he's not going to ask me to be his wife. Like, I'm not afraid of that. If you don't want to ask me to be his wife, he's not going to find better. <laughs> as simple as that. And I know that, you Solid. know? And so yeah. women need to get to that point where they're so confident in who they are, that they're not afraid if something bad happens. They're not afraid if they get shut down and they're not afraid if a man is like, uh, you're, you're too much, you know? And, and, and we need to create a safe space. And I'm really determined to create that for women. What are some things that women can do to increase that confidence to get there, to get to your level? Um, a lot of solitude, like just shut the noise, turn off. You know, I know we're listening to a podcast right now. <laughs> turn off the podcast, turn off the YouTube videos, stop going to meetups. Like I know this is like unpopular opinion, right? But you keep going to these events, you keep listening to these podcasts, you keep reading the books, and you're listening to everybody else but yourself. Mm. And the best person that can give us the best advice is ourselves because we constantly listen to our own thoughts. We constantly are talking to ourselves. And so once we get to that point where we're just alone and we can trust ourselves so much that if I need to make a decision and a hard decision, I trust myself so much that it's going to be such a great decision with the best results because I have a proven track record that the decisions that I have made up to this point have proven to be incredible. And it just takes a, a understanding of self-worth, self-determination and self-understanding and constantly proving to myself that I can do it. So I always recommend solitude, like hermit mode. Paul and I, we barely leave our house when we're in America. You won't see us at all the meetups everywhere. We don't listen to podcasts. 
You know, Pa and I spend a lot of time just me and him conversing, game planning, praying, meditating, writing down our goals. When we were in Thailand, we spent five days in the woods, <laughs> like in, in a very remote island with no internet. And uh, guess, where, guess where, this, where this vision and where this realization and these aha moments and, and uh, the decision to be able to let go of the people that I did let go happened. It happened in mm -hmm. Thailand. And I literally came back to America to execute. That's the only reason why I came back. So solitude, quietness, you know, meditation, prayer, journaling, um, and just trusting that whatever thoughts come into your mind, all those good thoughts, whatever good thoughts come in your mind, those ideas, you know, those visions, like when you close your eyes and see where you see yourself in five years, you know, ask God for guidance and trust that the path that he's going to lead you on is the right path. It's up to you to trust yourself to take that first step and be like, yo, I got this. Like the next step is going to be good. The next step is going to be good and it's going to be great. And a lot of this, again, it comes from my support to Paul because Paul knew that I needed to make this move last year. Hmm. And he just gave me the safe space to be like, she's going to, she's going to decide it on her own. And he just gave me that space to vent, to cry it out, to, to, for me to share how I'm feeling instead of saying like, I told you so, you should have done this a long time ago, blah, blah, blah. He'd just be like, you're getting there. You're getting there. And what else? And what else? Tell me more. And what else are you feeling? You know, and what's going on? And what, what about this? Have you thought about this? And, and, you know, why don't we go this direction and go that direction? And so he's given me that safe space for me to tell him like, yo, I, this is where I'm going. And what do you think? And so there needs to be a safe space in real estate. Understand, okay. understandable. I, you know, as, as a, um, you know, Tanner and I are founders of our company. And like I just yeah. shared, you know, we, we definitely need to bring on more people. Um, but we need to, we need to, we need more femininity and, you know, in, in our culture. Yes. You know, I was Paul, raised, Go ahead. Paul's manager, uh, the one that basically runs his acquisition is a woman. She has no ego. You know, she is super humble. You know, she says her opinions because Paul, again, gives her that safe space to say her opinions and to say what she feels. And and she chooses the right people for the company. But it's, it's some feminine energy is always great. So you That's say you were, raised, you were raised by mainly women. Yeah, well, so I was raised by my, you know, my, my dad was always in the picture, but my parents split. And so I, um, at a young age, I got asked uh, the crazy decision of who do I want to live with? Uh, and I was like, well, my dad's kind of a hard ass and my mom like gives me everything I want. I'm going to go with my mom. <laughs> and so, yeah, I ended up choosing my mom. And, and so, I, you know, because of that, I was raised by my mom and my sister. And so I, yeah. I, you know, have a, just a love and, a, and an understanding for the, um, just for the feminine, you know what I mean? And deep respect. Um, but not a lot of my friends share that same respect and not a lot of men do. So mm. for us, us men that are leading organizations, I know you're saying, you know, uh, uh, give them space. What does that look like for us? You know, how, how do women want to be heard from a male led organization? <laughs> well, my I turn. think, well, I think Paul should answer this because he, you know, yeah, Paul, what have you learned from Michelle? Like, what, what are some of the, the things that you've learned to just be a better spouse, to be more supportive, to be more understanding of not just her, but of her feminine essence? You know what I mean? And, and respecting and acknowledging that. Oh, uh, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of it comes down to what she talked about um, in terms of, you know, not just women need solitude and personal looking within. Men need that as well. And I had to take a lot of years of my life, especially my late twenties, just, you know, doing a lot of things, spending time alone, going to other countries by myself, working with plant medicine, just unplugging from communities to, to really break through, break down those barriers with the ego, mm -hmm. you know, feeling that I need control of everything or anyone, um, you know, and just letting go of all that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's that, that personal work, to like let, you know, it's never about removing of the ego. I don't think it's just about getting it in check, mm. you know, right. using it when right. I need it, you know? And I think that's the issue is a lot of men just lead with ego and it's like, they can't hear it. You know, mm. a lot of the people Michelle worked with, it's like, they're only hurting themselves, but not hearing another opinion. Right. And or just allowing mm. that ego to go down to say, Hey, what is, what do you actually think? You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was, 
like even towards the end of this project, they were in this group saying these sarcastic jokes back and forth. And Michelle's like, what's the update? What's the update? And they're just ignoring her. Mm. And, you know, I don't think it's ever intentional or right. like, you know, trying Malicious. to be hurtful or whatever. It's just men, you know, doing their thing where it's just like they think that they know best. And right. I think I've taken the time to really work on that, realize just like anybody, I don't know shit, man. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm after going to Thailand, I'm really intrigued by Buddhism. So I'm reading a, a book about the teachings of Buddha right now. And uh, I don't ha- I don't remember the exact quote, but he's like, uh, you know, if a person who realizes that they might be a fool means they're probably not one. But a person who thinks they're not a fool definitely is. Mm. And so, you know, it's these people think that they know everything and don't have to get any answers and take another point of view that are only hurting themselves. And so. You know, I'm just I, I'm grateful that I can have somebody that's so gentle in my business, you know, that can lead people in a gentle way, while also is very confident in who she is, mm-hmm. you know. And so it's just attracting high quality people. I mean, I don't know. I, don't even I know. think and I want to add on that. definitely men doing the inner work, like Paul said, is important. You know, before Paul and I were dating, we were both single for 10 plus years. We were both celibate, not having sex with randos for three plus years. Um, and so when we came together, we, we knew exactly what we were looking for. Mm. So that inner work is important, but also there like squash the whole gender role thing that, that traditional, you know, men are the head and the woman is the tail or whatever. What is it? The, men is the, <laughs> and the woman is the neck. Should the it, neck. You know? yeah. yeah. I'm not no fucking neck. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the head, the hair, the, the heart, like I'm all that, you know? Right. And so Paul and I were equals, you know, we, we split certain things or sometimes I pay for things. Sometimes Paul pay, pay for things. I drive, Paul drives. You know, um, sometimes I make more money than Paul. This month I made more money than Paul. Last month Paul made more money than me. Doesn't matter. We both freaking win. We we are a partnership. Yeah, when you know? she wins, I win. When right. I Absolutely. Win, That's it. You know, and so Paul does the dishes. I don't do dishes. Like that ruins my nails, and I pay like a hundred bucks for my nails. I don't do fucking dishes. <laughs> I don't fucking clean. We pay a cleaning lady to come clean. Why the hell hey. am I gonna? Clean? You know, we know married people who are like would hate if their partner made more money than them. For you know? sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah that's so, always been weird. I think yeah. there's a lot of that in men, too. Like they're intimidated by a woman making more, more money. money or even not, you know, being like, I'm the provider. You can't know. Like you go pursue your passions, but I'm the provider. And I right. think, you know, we've we've made it work where it's like we allow those roles, but there's no like strictness. Yeah, there's no strictness for sure. It's like it's equal partnership. And we are both equals. There's no one, the head or the neck or none of that shit. It's like, <laughs> this is not a traditional partnership. And I think that if the, if only right. like men with big egos and like that masculine energy can just turn it down a notch and realize that women are, we're right here, we can really take over the world. And Absolutely. Not just the network marketing, because network marketing was just a microcosm, I think, for the, the whole world. For sure, yeah. And that... Everywhere you go, especially in any community, a lot of the leaders are, are men. Alpha, alpha males with big egos, controlling, you Except know. Except Jamil. Yeah, Jamil. I bet Jamil's a different breed. Yeah, he's different. Uh, but a lot of the time, these high control, like insecure men who act all exciting and charming, but they really just want to control people and have power. And mm-hmm. so we just let that go. And like the goal is to make money and have a good time and achieve our goals. It's a little bit different. So mm-hmm. I think if I, I can. Love just put the ego to the side and use it when you need it instead of letting it drive the bus. It's just on the bus. Mm. That's huge. That's huge. Like, as you're saying that I'm, I'm thinking about what you're saying and I'm putting it kind of into mental practice and it makes all the sense. You know, mm-hmm. if I can uh, learn to check my ego, you know, at the time where I feel it coming up, cause you can kind of feel it. And so if I can learn to check that, especially in a scenario where it's not that I need to curb my ego just because I'm, I'm dealing with a woman or whatnot, but I just, I need to be conscious of that, you know what I mean? And, and be more aware. So thank you for that, that insight, man. And I, I do want to ask you, it's a, it's a little bit of a pivot, but I'm curious, um, Paul, I want to ask you this question. What is, what's a criticism um, that you've heard about yourself that you've found is actually one of your greatest strengths? Well, I think it kind of is actually a good segue because it's a lot of what you're talking about is that I am not one of those alpha males. Mm. You know, I don't, you know, I've always, I've always felt that I'm not. And I think that's been a big criticism, like, Mm. especially in network marketing. Oh, here's a great example. (laughs) 
in network marketing, most of the leaders are these very narcissistic, controlling men. I think a lot of them have lack empathy. So they're like sociopath, psychopathic men um, where it's all about, you know, that's how they're able to just use people to achieve their goals because they're just they're not people. They're just tools to their to the end, justify their means. Right. Um, and in that I had I, I had a lot of success, you know, when I was in network marketing um, and in that realm, they never, un they, it was always, what have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. So it never mattered what I had done or the potential I had or recognizing my strengths. It was simply, are you doing enough of the work you're supposed to be doing? And are you getting enough of the results? Mm -hmm. And are you moving on and in, in, in hitting these levels? And if you're not, then get out of here. We don't want to hear from you. And I was always belittled and made feel that I wasn't, uh, that I had no value or that they didn't see my strengths even though I did certain things that people that mentors, mentors, mentors couldn't do. Like I, when I was in my twenties, I went to Jamaica 15 times and I, I helped launch a network marketing company down there and built a massive team of hundreds of people, helped people down there make a lot of money, um, stuff that my mentors couldn't do, mm -hmm. but they never valued that or cared for that. So it was like this criticism, I guess, of that. I'm not just this, like put my head down and grind, grind, grind. Mm. That's just not my style. Like, it's just not who I am. And I'm not, I don't see people as tools to achieve a goal. I see them as partnerships and how can we both win? And so I think in network marketing, I really felt small because of that. And now I'm in a business where I'm able to leverage that strength. And whenever we get to this part, I can share about what's going on in my company now and how I'm finally in a place where I can use all these strengths and mm. they're, they're helping me catapult my business ahead. Mm. Dude. Well, I mean, gosh, on that note, I, I, I do want to ask Michelle the same question, um, but Paul, yeah. I want to get back and hear about you know what's going on now. So Michelle, what about you? Because I I can't imagine you get a lot of criticisms, but has has there been one kind of a common theme that you realize is actually that's that's a strength. That's not a weakness. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that I'm too much. That's that's always been my thing. Like it's just too much or. Too confident, too confident, too outspoken. Too outspoken. You're too much of a feminist was always my thing. Cause yeah, she'd get banned from talking to married women because she'd be empowering them too much. Um, I always tell, <laughs> you know, I, I just don't settle for like little things. I don't, and I also don't get impressed by little things, you know, like I, if Paul proposes to me in a motherfucking Dunkin' Donuts, I'm going to say no. I said, eh, next time, try again. You know, if the ring is not at least five carats, I'm like, mm -hmm, try again. You know, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> know your worth. And it's not because like, oh, you're ungrate. Like always, oh, you know, there's people that are hungry out there. I get it. I used to be hungry too. I used to look for pennies and dimes just to get on the bus so I can go to school. Like I get it. I grew up in the Bronx. I was poor. But in my mind, I always knew that I am the daughter of a king and that the, the person that created me also created this world. So I am worthy of great things. And so I think that's another big criticism is that Your standards uh, are too my high. standards are too high and that it really does affect some women that maybe have settled in their mm. life. And they're just like, well, Michelle, you don't know my situation. I, you don't know my situation either. You, you don't know where I've been through. You don't know how many toxic men I've been with. You don't know how many abusive relationships I've been in. And so I've learned from those experiences that I was going to attract a man that was going to be like meet my standards and blow past it. And that's the reason why my man takes me on luxury trips every two months. And that's the reason why my man takes care of me very well. And he and he takes me all over the world on business class front row seats like I will not accept anything less. He wants to take me to a, a different country. I'm not flying economy ever again. I do not clean this kitchen. You hire somebody to do that, you know, like, and it's just, I, that's a criticism that I ever had. And I think that, you know, I think it's a strength, you know, once I feel like once more women see their power and they're confident in themselves and they raise their standards, you always, like they use the same business. You will never, uh, you only attract things, people, companies, money, opportunities. opportunities at your level or above. You know, your business will never surpass your self-esteem and your self-image ever. So wherever you are, whatever you attracted, it's if, as long as you continue to keep doing that work, it's going to continue to elevate and elevate and elevate and elevate. If you just stay stagnant, it's going to keep going backwards. So I think that's one of the criticisms I've had since I was like a teenager. 
I see that, Ooh. that man, that's powerful. I, you, you, this is, I don't know why I'm going to say this, but it's just, it's, it's something that I observed just yesterday. I was looking on our YouTube and I was going through just some of the comments from our, I don't know, 38, 39 podcast that we've had. Yeah. <clears throat> and I noticed there's a, there's a likes and a dislikes and they hide the dislikes, right? Oh, they they, they look too. Yeah, they hide them from public view, but I can, you know, you could see them on the back end. Um, But what's interesting, and I don't know, maybe someone can go look and see the Wholesale Elite page. Out of the 39, 40 interviews or whatever that we've done so far, everything's 100%. All the likes are great. The only two people that have dislikes are both women. Ah! The only, it's so weird. It's the strangest thing. And they're really good interviews. That you interviewed? That, yeah, on, yeah, on our podcast. Those are the only ones that had any sort of negative feedback. Can you, and, can you see what type of gender is watching the most? Yes, we can. But uh, one, one of those did have a comment. I'm just making an assumption. Uh, yeah. One of those uh, negative things did have a comment, and the comment was negative, and it was left by a woman. Yeah. And so my, my, I guess my next question is, how can... I don't want to say how can I don't want to stay in this whole gender role, uh, mm-hmm. but I think it's very important because, you know, like, like you know, obviously I'm for anyone watching, I'm, I'm African American. You probably can't tell it by the sound of my voice, um, <laughs> but but I but I am, and you know, there's a big thing, you know, in our community that hey, you know, we need to look out for one another, and so I, I constantly right. ask myself, okay, cool, how can I how can I champion this, but not isolate it at the same time? You know what I mean? Like how can I how can I how can I push this agenda forward, saying, look, I I agree, but that's not. That's not the hill I'm dying on. What, what yeah. would you say, you know, what's your message for other women who maybe, you know, see a person like you and maybe do feel overwhelmed or intimidated and their natural intention is to push back? Because there's probably someone who's listened to this up at this point and said, you know, rolled their eyes at something you said or did or whatever. What is, what's your feedback to them? Well, um, I mean, they might be not nice. Be nice. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I'm I mean, that. unfortunately, nice. but unfortunately, that has nothing to do with me. Well, what I was going to say is, unfortunately, mm, most people good. are not lucky enough to have someone in their life to tell them what they need to hear. Right. And, and so Michelle is saying something that they, these, some people may need to hear, but don't want to hear, and right. so they're going to dislike. Or they're not ready to hear. Or they're it. not ready to right? hear. Right. Yeah. Their self image is like not when, ready to hear. When it. we were network marketing, and people would tell us, "Oh, this is a cult. Get out!" and be like, "No, you're wrong." And now we're like, "Oh yeah, they were right." <laughs> <laughs> you just gotta, you know. Well, yeah, number one, if it's like whatever I'm saying is affecting your ego, or um, you are triggered, or you are what's the word? I'm offended, or you are offended by whatever I'm saying. That has nothing to do with the words that I'm saying, and everything to do with who you are right now as a person as a human being and where you are in your life and that's and that's fine you know if if i would have heard this you know 20 maybe 15 years ago where i thought like gender roles was important and i thought that i wanted to be married early and have kids early i would have been like girl this girl is fucking crazy like she's gonna get killed you know and so (laughs) it's about elevation and you know you you will only vibe with people at your vibration or higher so if if you're not resonating with what I'm saying, we're just not vibing. And that's totally fine. Just turn the radio to another station. Mm, the people yeah. who, are hear it, who are ready to hear it, who can benefit from it, will hear it. The people who want to be angry at Michelle and want to, you know, stay complacent or who are just not ready to hear it. That's fine. That's totally. We cool. love them too. And we wish them the best. For sure. Let's raise that vibration. Yeah, a, a mentor of mine said a long time ago, and I love it. I think of this all the time. He said, the truth will set you free, but oh. first it'll probably piss you off. Yes. I love I, that. Yeah, I love that. I was like, it's so true. Gosh, yeah. everything that I needed to hear, I hated hearing. For sure. I mean, I like, I hated the fact that I had to let go of my acquisition manager. You know, I, I hated it. Oh, like, I hated when Michelle called me out of my shit. Yeah, mm. I hated it. I, would, I cried so much that week that all of this was going down. I mean, tears on tears. Like, I didn't want to get out of bed. because he probably didn't do the same thing. For, okay, which is fine. <laughs> Man, right? No, that's not right. Um, <laughs> right? <laughs> it totally well, pissed me off that I let you know, him basically take control of my company, you know, it's like, it pissed me off. And so 
but it set me free. Like I feel so free right now and I feel so in control of everything that I'm doing. And, and that's really what I've always wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it, what's funny is I bet he does too. You know, there was yeah, probably the reason yeah. why he wasn't hustling because there was probably something that he wasn't comfortable with telling you or something, yeah. you know, and because of that, it held him back and then there was no productivity. And, and so now that, you know, everyone's free, everyone's, everyone's free. Yeah, everyone knows, you know, knows where everyone else stands. So well done. Right, exactly. If you love something, set it free and let it, and let it be. If it's meant to come, come, back, come back, it will, you know. Oh, so. so good, so good. Paul, I want to I want to go into what's new. Like, like tell yeah. me what's happened lately, man. Yeah. And I wanted to add to what you said before about the criticism. Please. Because I think a better way of saying it is that I am a very empathic leader, which mm -hmm. I think especially with men is not the normal. At least it isn't in the you know, tradition. Right. I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. If you guys haven't, you know, read anything by him, I highly recommend any of his books. The yeah. Infinite Game, his, I don't know if he has a newer one, but the last one I read is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, and it's all about how imp a lot of what he does is teaches uh, leaders of major companies how to lead with em empathy. And that is how, a big way of how they can really transform their company and actually get people to want to come into work because his passion is about how can I get people to want to be mm. excited about their jobs? to be excited about what they do every day. That's his passion. Uh, and so I think that style of leadership doesn't work in network marketing, or at least it hasn't uh, a lot of the times because it's a very much, like I said, if, if you're not doing what you do, I don't want to hear from you. I'm going to replace you. Mm -hmm. I can only put the people on the stage who are doing the work. We don't care if you like people or care for people. That doesn't mean anything. And so that style of leadership, while it led me to a lot of success, didn't benefit me the way they wanted to. And then also I'm the type of person where it's like, I want to work hard and then I want to build a team to let them work hard. So I don't have mm -hmm. to work hard anymore. Leverage. You know, that who not, that who not how mentality, right? right? My, my idea in network marketing was always to build three different teams, really big. So they'd make, they, they, they're successful and I'd make money. And now I'm doing the exact same thing in my business. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's taken two years to build the groundwork to get here and to get myself right and get the foundation right. And now it's the most exciting times. And it's like she said about the self-image, you know, my, we have never attracted more high quality people in my company than I have ever before. For sure. So we brought in a batch of people back in, I think, January. Um, and one of these people, uh, he uh, was already a successful wholesaler in Georgia. He already was doing his own flips. He's an agent, like just a really quality person. When I interviewed him, I was even like, why do you want to work for me? You know, making only a percentage of the assignment fees you could do. Sure. And he, he wanted to learn our strategies and how we did things. And so we came aboard. He's been averaging $5,000 a month of income just from us, from a couple hours a week of effort. Um, and now he's built these agent relationships that he barely has to work anymore. He's just continuing to build these relationships. And then they get these deals off market before anybody else gets them, sends us to us. And we moved them and we moved. He sent us two deals, moved them both. And now he sends us everything. Mm. And so not only that, he partnered with this guy where he's not just doing Tennessee, Tennessee deals with us. The guy's sending him deals in Georgia and they're doing them on the side for himself. So and good. so it's creating this win-win-win scenario. Why, why would he ever want to leave us now? <laughs> sure. You know? And then now we, we just brought in, uh, we're bringing, we have a trial run now. We, we do trial runs before we bring people in. Smart. It just started today with eight people. Uh, seven, wow. of them for, seven of them are from Tennessee. One's from Colorado. Uh, I'm opening a Colorado department because Michelle won't hire men. So, um, <laughs> And these are the highest quality people that I've ever brought on people who are already very successful in real estate. The only people I've ever had in my acquisition team actually close a deal are people who are already confident on the phone and already successful in real estate. Any newbie, newbie who comes in, they're always weird and never works. Mm -hmm. So I'm right. bringing in people who are already successful agents in Tennessee. One of my buyers is now a part of my acquisition team. Nice. So crazy. Oh, wow. I have agents in Colorado. I have, you know, flippers. Like I have people who are uh, people who, work full-time at wholesale companies, people who all these different things, and they're all now coming in. It's, it's so exciting. Mm -hmm. I've never prepared them more. I've never got, I've never been more clear about what our company stands for, what we're about. And then on top of that, Michelle's launching a, te a Texas department that I'm one of my people is from Texas. So she's going to work with her. And then I am launching a direct to seller department, which I've never done before. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm just figuring all this stuff out. And just like the same mentality in network marketing, I'm putting it here. How can I find the right people, empower them, encourage them, set the stage and allow them to do what they love to do? I don't want to call sellers. I don't want to call agents. 
but I'm going to find people who love doing it, who are good at it. And you know what I like doing is I like empowering these people. I like encouraging these people and making sure that they feel appreciated and helping them win. Right. And then I like disco yeah. sales of the property. So it creates this beautiful symbiotic relationship. And like this guy who's going to hopefully lead our direct to seller department, he has only ever done it himself. He's never led a team. Mm. And so now I'm teaching him how to do that. And so it's like really exciting. Right. So there's, there's so many amazing things happening. We, I closed a $50,000 deal while we're in Thailand. That was such a 50, crazy. five zero. Five yeah. $50,000. We were in Thailand. It was like 1.7 million Thai bot or whatever, <laughs> which is like more than the average <laughs> Thai person makes in like five years or something. Oh and then even God. today, FedEx showed up. I just got a check in the mail. So I thought <laughs> it was a his drama. Like, what? <laughs> awesome. He was trying to surprise me. I'm like, I checked. So things are happening. We just closed our seventh deal of the year. You know, we don't close the most deals, but we, we set our goal to make the most, highest assignment fee, which averages okay. around 25000 So even our wholesale, our acquisition partners are making five grand a deal. So it's, that's that's full-time job income, you right. know? That's, well, that's, one thing I want to the, the piggyback, and I know I haven't said much because I've been a fly on the wall, which has actually been really <laughs> nice because I've, like, I've, <laughs> I've got like, a whole page of notes. Like, I feel like I'm learning so much with, from you guys. Oh. So um, the... One thing I wanted to mention, though, is I feel like you have to have, well, it's more of a compliment first, a compliment to both of you on both of y'all's self-awareness. Um, mm. Incredible. You know what your strengths are. You know where maybe your weaknesses are. Um, but I think that's for the who, not how uh, of entrepreneurs or business owners. I feel like in order to know who to replace or who to bring on, um, mm. you need to be self-aware. You need to know what your strengths and weaknesses are. And so you need to have that time, like you guys were saying earlier in the episode, to reflect um have that that moment of peace in your mind where this is what i need to work on in myself before you right. can really take that next step um totally. and i think that just shows why you guys have been so successful at building your companies and your businesses i mean attracting good people again because the people that you do attract um the universe knows you guys are self-aware enough to know those are those people were placing weaknesses in yourself um, right. and so i think that whole it's like a whole circle of life type of thing and you guys are killing it um and i had to jump in and just applaud before i forget i have it written down but uh, thank you uh, that's, you know, and, that's and everything so we do we want to be a blessing because we believe god wants to bless the people that's blessing others and mm. we'll and we'll be a blessing with the money you know good stewards of the money right. so like we've we've had you know life is kind of like this it's usually a plateau and then a growth and then another plateau and it feels like we've been in a bit of a plateau because we had so much internal growth. Yeah. Right. And now the external growth is coming, you know, and we're just, we're very, very excited about it. Yeah. It's like the old bamboo tree that that's, that's, yeah. that story. That's it. That's that's it. it. Oh, I love that story. Oh, every, that brings me back. <laughs> yeah. They, we heard that too many times in the marketing, but yes. Yeah. For real. Or the pumping of the well. <laughs> yeah, or three feet from gold. Like there's so yeah. many stories. One. Yeah. I love it. Look, there's one thing I do want to share um, to anybody, like if there's one piece of wisdom I could leave, um, which we've already said it, but to make it clear is, you know, stop looking for the answers anywhere, but within yourself. Right. right. There's stop idolizing other human beings, whether mm -hmm. you think it's a mentor or a coach or a celebrity, yes. you know, or even us, like they're all just regular human right. beings. Some of them want that, you know, recognition. Some of them don't. But, you know, just be careful because when you want, search for the answers in other people, they can manipulate and control you because or, then you yeah. need them. Or they can limit you. Yes. You know, you can be better than us. You can be better than Jamil. You can be That's better so than all good. these other gurus out there. And so if you just want to be like us, like Jamil, like all these other gurus out there, maybe God just has a plan for those people to just hit here. But for you, he may want you to hit over there, but because you're so bogged down on this limit. It's like it can really just stop you from such exponential growth. So this is one of the reasons why Paul and I, we don't have idols at all. Mm. We don't look up to people. We only look up to our source, you know, our God. And and this is why we don't you don't really see us at all these events and hoorah, hoorah. And and why we only agree to podcast with people that we actually know and we vibe with. Like we right. don't want recognition. We don't want to be on crazy stages we, we just we don't want to be the calls conference and calls meetings and, and meetings and it's just like oh, let me hire right. people to run it well yeah. yeah right and it's and mainly because it's like we're we are working towards talking to god and being in solitude and talking to ourselves as, as to where does god want to take us to mm. 
and then just following that path. That's mm -hmm. it. We're not looking up to the next per we're not gonna we're not trying to be the next Jamil, the next anybody. We're just focusing on becoming the best version mm -hmm. of ourselves and, and where God wants to take us. Because and for, for 10 years we were blinded and right. didn't see that our mentors, you know, that we idolized had their own agenda and their right. own desire to limit us and control us. And we totally. don't we don't want other people to go through that. Yes. Although yeah. most people <laughs> and they already have. Can't, yeah. can't serve two masters, right? Um, that's so that's powerful. Dude, let me ask you, because you, you touched on something, and I genuinely am asking you this because I, I want to get your take. It's not just for the audience, you know, to learn something, but but I, I would like to know. I consider myself a high EQ person, right? Um, yeah. I just, I'm very tapped into my emotions. We, we talked about Tanner and I, that like we met recently for the first Love time. We worked together for a while. No way. Isn't We're, that the best when you meet somebody in person? It's like, oh. Yeah, I mean, I dapped him up and everything, but it's like I had known him. You know what I mean? It wasn't even weird. I kind of like, I just, uh, but it was good. It was good. But our first time we're driving, we got about a two hour drive and and I go past um, an old mentor of mine's place and I just start freaking boohooing in the truck. I'm trying to tell him the story, but I can't get it out. Like I can't. Um, so Tanner's a savage. He has absolutely no emotions. He's just stone cold. <laughs> like, but, uh, nice. but. None, nonetheless, EQ, you, Paul, you had mentioned, you know, um, about the book, about uh, Simon Sinek's book and how mm -hmm. it really helps, you know, uh, uh, people to be able to, you know, tap into their emotions a little bit. Let me ask you candidly, do you think it's possible for someone who has a low EQ or just no EQ to like, you can't improve your IQ. You know what I mean? You're either intelligent or you're not. Can you improve your EQ? Yeah, I think so. I think the biggest issue is most people who are in that place either are unaware of it mm. or are unwilling to change it right. mm. or both. Mm. And so, you know, because Simon Sinek talks a lot, he goes into these major companies mm. to help them make these shifts. And it's really, really hard because obviously it starts with the leadership, which sometimes needs to change. So right. it's, it's a very, very hard shift, which can be done. Right. But it's not easy. But there, there has to be that desire there to change, just like can an obese person lose weight even if they've been obese their whole life? Yeah, of course. But it has to take a, a real desire to change and to do things differently, which is just not easy. And then sustainable change, not just lose the weight, but keep it off. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and then some people just, you know, pretend that they're gaining an IQ just to make it seem like they're woke or whatever it is. So, <laughs> right. you know, it's right. It's again, like all of these are just boxes of identity that people use to hold themselves back. So, you know, I think, if people, if somebody wants to do that, like I remember one time somebody asked me like, how do you, you built all these big teams? This is back in network marketing and in like Jamaica and all these places and they're so big and how do you do it? And I'm just like, I care about people. <laughs> it's like, I don't know. How do I teach that to somebody? Right. Like I truly sure. care about these people on my team. I don't want to replace them. I want to see them win. But in that environment, it's very like, no, you just replace them if they don't do the work. Mm. So it, that my thinking didn't really work so well there. So <laughs> I don't know how to teach it. Um, I feel like I just attract people who have it, but yeah, if somebody wants, I'm sure improvement can be had. Right. Maybe Michelle Got has it. a better answer. No, totally. Cause you know, I was, I was definitely that person with a low EQ where I didn't really care about people. I didn't care about their emotions. I just wanted to grind. I wanted to get to the top. I want to get to the top of the pyramid. I want to be the keynote speaker. I wanted all the accolades. <laughs> And so it definitely took some time for me to like take a step back. I read this book called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie, literally changed my life. Um, and yeah, and you know, I, and, and really tapping into my empathic um, nature. I'm a very empathic person. I feel energy like, like the wind, like I feel it as soon as it touches me. And so really tapping into that and seeing that that, that is a major strength. Um, and again, spending a lot of time in solitude to really recognize what that looks like and and knowing how to empathize with other people and putting pe yourself in other people's shoes and increasing that emotional intelligence. And, and a lot of people think emotions is, you weakness. know, weakness, you know, and it's yeah, actually right. a strength to right. be able to sit down and, you know, if someone's hurting, like literally sit down with them and, and listen to them and empathize and and feel their pain and, and, and offer advice or offer some type of guidance. So it's really special. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and being genuine with it, you know, yeah, that's, 
That's huge. And guys, I mean, you, you guys are always wonderful people. And, and again, thank you for your time and, and for coming on our show. And, and I, I do want to, you know, st start to wrap this up, but, but I, I have to ask, cause I'm just curious, you guys, you know, you've, you've had quite the journey. Uh, you guys have been in personal development for, for a minute now, you know, and you've done a yeah. lot of self work at this point. What's, what's one of the books that you recommend the most in, in your business right now? Uh, I mean, it really yeah. depends yeah, on where they, are. where they are and what this person needs. Um, I mean, Great Who, Not How, Who yeah. Not How is definitely a book for people who want to really scale. lead an organization and scale. Uh, I think The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek is really good because it's helping people understand that business is, a, is an infinite game, not a finite game. So mm -hmm. people just make such short-sighted decisions, right? I want to win on this deal. I want to make this assignment fee. I want to get this deal done, but then you're burning a relationship, right? Mm. That's a finite thinking in a, in a game that's infinite, mm. right? My goal is not to do a deal this month. My goal is to do a deal every month mm. continually, right? That I could either give this company to my kids one day or sell it to somebody one day. Either way, it's an infinite game. And so I think that is a very good book that probably most people in real estate have not read. Um, yeah, that's have really you good. heard? I, I just reached back because I you, you you mentioned earlier about Buddhism, and uh, my my best friend is a I wouldn't call it I guess maybe he'd call himself a Buddhist I don't know, um, but he's really into studying and learning the philosophies and he's the guy I was telling you about who's who's the doctor in right there in Phoenix, um, but he told me about this book called The Diamond Cutter, by Geshe oh. Michael Roach. I think we have that on our Amazon. I don't card. know that one. Yeah, but I think I've seen that. What's the author? Uh, it's, so his name's Geshe Michael Roach. Okay. Um, for for any of those that are listening, I, I I don't give book recommendations. I I mean I'm i I've got a you know books and <laughs> yeah. audio books and all that stuff and same you know same as you guys. It's tough. I had a guy text me last night and ask me, uh, hey, what's a book? You know what what's a book that you'd like to read? And I said, man, it really does depend on where you're at right now. You know because I don't I don't want to just give you a random book. But, they can go rich, go read it, you know, have to knock yourself out. Um, but more specifically, you know, this book is cool because I'm going to, I'll tell you about this book and then I'll tell you about another one right after that's also written by him. Yeah. So my best friend, he recommended this book to me and I'm like the diamond cutter. He's like, dude, you know, once you start it, you're not going to want to put it down. Um, and so I start reading this thing and sure enough, I'll, I'll tell you really quick. So Geshe Michael Roach is, uh, Geshe is, is a title in Buddhism and it's, it's almost like professor, but it's like mm. the highest level, oh, okay. like attainable, right? In, in Buddhism for, for, that, for that title. Um, now, Michael Roach is the only American geisha ever. Like there's, there hasn't been another one since. And his story is incredible, but he essentially, he essentially talks about he was an Ivy League guy. Some crappy stuff happened in his life. He ended up going uh, to Tibet, studied at a monastery, didn't leave there. He stayed there for 20 years and just got really immersed in the culture and then, uh, in, the, in the practices and everything. And he ended up attaining the level of geisha. Now, at the end, his I forget what, what his you know, teachers called or whatever, but he challenged him to go back to America and to start a business using all the philosophies that he's learned in Buddhism, but not able to tell anyone that this is Buddhism stuff. Oh, he, just, wow. he had to keep it. <clears throat> And the business that he chose was the diamond business, like one of the dirtiest, you know, businesses yeah. out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it's a, it's an incredible story of how he took uh, his, his diamond company from nothing to a multi, multi-million dollar company. Um, and it's just the story, right? So that's the diamond cutter. This next one, I'm going to geek out. It's called karmic management. Oh my so gosh. Is, I some good recommendations. I'm going to write these down. Well, I'll tell you, and I'll, you know, I can send these to you afterwards, but. Um, it sounds so good. It's funny because I was, I actually, my last job ever before the pandemic shut down, everything was in the diamond industry. And wow. when you said it's a very dirty business, that is 1000% correct. It oh is my gosh. Dirty, dirty. Thankfully, I was just, um, I was kind of like the office manager. So. Uh, I, didn't, you know, I just saw the numbers roll in like six figure days. No blood's on my hands. I'm good. <laughs> and I saw these beautiful diamonds every day, but the business is crazy. So I'm definitely 
right now. Well, yeah. real quick, I will say karmic management. This is also written by Geshe. Um, okay. he, he wrote that book afterwards. That book is wild because the first one's a story, right? The first okay. one gets you like, wow, that's really cool. Like, I didn't know. I understand karma so much better. I thought karma was just, you do this and it comes back at you, good or bad. And that is a very simplistic answer. Karmic management right. actually teaches you the practical application of karma. And um, I mean, it, it is so specific. Like um, if you are having a relationship problem in your business to where uh -huh. these, you know, these two coworkers uh, can't get along, something like that. He's like, go to a nursing home and help for two weeks or so. Very specific, very practical steps. Wow. And then he explains how the karmic energy offsets. The reason why this is happening is because this is happening. Fix this and this will change. And my, my best friend who's a doctor, he, I was like, dude, you know, really? He's like, try it. It's worked for me. I've seen his business go from nothing to now he's traveling the world and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. And this is in the oh period God. of a year and a half. So- Amazing. Yeah, those are great books. I, I I added that to my Amazon cart I immediately. Love it. Yeah, if I you, love that. If you like that, you're gonna love. If you haven't, if read, haven't it, read it, if you haven't read it, if you haven't read this book already, um, the surrender experiment. Have you read this? No, I haven't even heard of it. Oh, right. It is very similar to the Diamond Cutter. It's about this guy who lives in the woods. Uh, well, all he wants to do is meditate in the woods. He's getting his master's degree, um, and. He just makes this decision. I'm just going to surrender to whether, whatever likes comes to me. Even if that voice in my head doesn't want it, I'm just going to surrender to it. And he goes from meditating in the woods by himself to running a multi-billion dollar company. That he uh, didn't even want. That he didn't even want. <laughs> awesome. And wow. ended up uh, getting falsely accused of all this stuff and losing the entire company. And he's just chill. And then ended up becoming really wealthy from these books. And, all, and he has a basically a meditation center where everybody he works with comes and meditates with him. Um, and then this is like the story version. And then he has the, the, untethered, uh, the untethered soul, which is the practical application book about it. Mm. My, fantastic, dude. Thank you so right. much. As soon as we end this, I'm, I'm buying that because I'm, right. I'm ready to get to that it's, next it's level. You're going to be on edge with that book. It's, yeah, you won't it's it amazing. And it just reminds me of like, you know, uh, you know, we're obviously all in real estate. We're here to make money. And, you know, th I think that's another big thing that kind of like affects me within the industry is like it's all about the money, 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 the hustle, the grind, you know, the noise and stuff like that. And so when we were in Thailand, we we got the privilege of spending time with elephants. And if you've never spent your time or energy around these amazing wisdom, loving animals, like you, you just have to make the trip out there. And we literally met people that dedicate their whole lives to taking care of just elephants. And it just puts so many things into perspective for us that there's so many people just literally ruining their marriages, killing themselves mentally, physically, just to be the best of the best in real estate. And then we met people that are the happiest people ever, just taking care of beautiful animals in a sanctuary. These are animals that have been beaten up and abused by and so, tourists. By tourists. Um, and so mm -hmm. they now get to take care of them. And, and, and this sanctuary takes care of all the generations of families that are going to take care of nice. these elephants. And uh. it's just put so many things into perspective, right? When you read the mm -hmm. book, this man, all he wanted to do was meditate in the woods all day, every day. And then just surrendering to God and, and surrendering, it led him to owning a billion dollar company that he didn't even want. And he just used that to bless more people. It's just such a beautiful perspective to have, you know? Thank you guys. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, I want to ask one last question um, sure. and just kind of in closing, um, it's it's kind of a big one, um, but I think you guys will, will knock it out of the park. But I want to ask it to each of you, and Paul, I'll start with you first. How do you measure success? Oof. Mm. That's a good one. Mm. That's a tough question. Huh? I mean, I, I don't <laughs> think there's one answer. Yeah. Um, I think how much I live up to the potential that I see in myself is a very big one that how much I'm, I'm living as the best version of myself, the most authentic version of myself living most in alignment with who I see myself as. Right. So like right now we're, 
you know, competitive athletes and like that doing that makes me feel so authentic and so grounded in who I am. Um, I think over overcoming things that I didn't think I could do, like building a successful company that pays me that and, and, and in that journey, that's a success to me, uh, sure. attracting such high quality people. That's like validation to me of like, wow, the, sh the shit we're doing is working. Right. Like we're succeeding because look at who wants to work with us. Mm. Right. You know what right. I mean? Um, and you know, the people that we get to impact, I just had a friend over who's like a, a, a flexologist and we empowered him to start his own company and I'm helping him get his LLC and get clients. And it's like the, the ability that I get to share what I love doing and help others. And I just feel so, I guess to summarize it is, you know, just like in this book, it's how, how in the flow of life am I, how, how much am I really surrendering uh, in living in that highest vibration of excitement for my life. Oh, it's so good. Thank you for that. Thank so you. Good. Michelle, what, what do you got? How do you um, measure success? How do I measure success? So, you know, in, in the beginning, like, you know, again, our network marketing days. The, Money. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I measure success many years ago, validation. right? It's validation. Sure. Success and recognition and money and all that stuff. Gucci bags. And Gucci bags and how many luxury cars and stuff like that, you know, like you own. It, it's so interesting because Paul and I, we don't really, you know, we don't own a house. We don't own cars, but uh, we do own our life a hundred percent, you know. And um, I saw this, I was listening to this podcast and I sent the quote to Paul. I'm going to read it to you because I think it's so powerful. And it says, detachment which is really what our lifestyle is as nomads is every two right. months, we technically don't have a home. We do, we do, we do have a lease how we are leasing a house here in Arizona just because we didn't want to go back and forth with um, storage lockers and stuff. So sure. that's perfect. But with our lifestyle, we are two months in the U S every month we're away. So it balances out to six months in the U S six months outside. And so every time it's time to go to another country, we're detached from all of our belongings, all of our, jewelry and like all the things our that habits, we add, our, our habits, our activities, our communities. our communities, like we completely detach. And so this um, Jay Shetty was the podcast I was listening to. And he said, detachment doesn't mean you own nothing. It means nothing owns you. Oh, so good. Right. And I feel like that's really what Paul and I embody is that we may not be multimillionaires through the things that we own, yeah. But, but or like that we have, like we don't own a lot of real estate. We, you know, we're right not now, yet. we're just not yet, at least. Sure. We're really building up the cash to be able to own real estate all over the world. That is our, our that is our major goal. Um, but I feel like right now there's two ways that I measure success is number one, um, they're the owner of the, of the uh, education company we used to be a part of said success is about how many people are better off because you've lived. And so there's Ooh. two there's two ways there's two ways to look at this right. Sure. I feel like a lot of people they a lot of gurus especially they hear that quote and so they want to create communities where they can control people and they mm. want to like ruin their marriage and go be around and travel the world to be able to like be around people and I need to help people I need to bless people and I feel like that's the toxic way of doing it. Whereas the way that I see it is I still do believe that success is how many people are better off because of our example and who we are as people. And so Paul and I, we just live by example and let the vibrations of our life like reach the right people ripple. and ripple, make a ripple effect. So that way we attract the right people that we can empower. You know, our, 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 um, our CrossFit coach never left the country ever. And we guided her and, and helped her come to Thailand with us. Nice. And we, yeah, and we paid for all the activities. She just had to get there, you know. So she never left the country before. She got her passport the day before she got on the plane. Like that is that is an effect. Like she said, she's she's never been the same since then. You know, the flexologist that left a toxic work environment to start his own company and we're his first clients. That's somebody that is that benefited, you know, and is in, and is impacted. You know, um, if you look at what Jamil is doing, right, he's created a blueprint for people like us to be able to follow. And we're better off because of what he created. And so it's definitely that that is the, the healthy way of that quote is how many people are better off 
because we have lived in our example. And then the second way that I measure success is I, I remember hearing another quote where it's like the worst, you want to know what's my biggest nightmare and everybody's worst nightmare should be is going to heaven and God showing you who you could have been. Mm. Right. And so th mm. that is where I'm in right now is like my birthday is International Women's Day, March 8th. Hey. I've, had, I've had this vision of impacting and empowering women since I was in Amway. And, you know, I've been a little bit complacent lately with, you know, how much money we've been making and sure. finally being able to travel. And, you know, just I, I just live such a chill life. I wake up whenever I want. I do whatever I want. And so but in the back of my mind, I keep thinking about this vision and this purpose that God has planted in my heart for a long time. And I've kind of put it to the side because I I, I didn't want the recognition. I don't want to like coach everybody. Um, and so my biggest fear is going to heaven and show and God showing me who I could have been to others, other women who I could have been um, at this level that God was trying to take me to. And so that's how I define success as becoming everything that I'm meant to be in this lifetime. And then also letting my life be an example to inspire people and say, you know, because of Paul and Michelle, I'm traveling, you know, because of Paul and Michelle, I've been able to, you know, pay for my daughter's education. And so that's, that's really how I define it for myself. Mm. Oh, so powerful. I feel like I'm sitting on the front row right now, like just leaning in, like, this is Hello. good. Thank you guys, you. I mean, you, you guys are clearly, clearly just wonderful people. Um, you have huge hearts of gold and I can sit here and, and give all the accolades. But guys, I want all of you, the listeners, the audience to experience Paul and Michelle for real. Like, how can people work with you? How can people get in touch with you? Can can they send you deals? Are, are you yes. are you letting women like are, are women able to come on your team now? Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll send you our application for Perfect. women for women to apply to work for my all women's company. And then I have a link for anybody. <laughs> hey, let's go, we'll Paul. All genders. <laughs> all are welcome. All are there you go, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so like, I don't discriminate. Paul well, doesn't discriminate. I discriminate. So, <laughs> so we'll have two links of applications, um, and then we'll we'll drop our emails or people to send Perfect. us deals. Yeah, as we're well. working in Tennessee, Colorado, and, and we're about to launch in Texas. So yeah, so by the time this drops, we'll definitely have Texas department all set up and go. So those three markets are our markets, and, and they can email it. Too. Yeah, and then they can reach out to us on Instagram. Uh, at Michelle Garbito and at Create Abundance. The E in Create is a three. So we'll have it, I'm sure, in the show notes. Absolutely. And follow our journey. We're heading to Europe this summer and it's going to yeah. be amazing. And we have some really fun plans out there in Europe. And we have a lot of exciting things happening that we can share later on. That's Absolutely. Awesome. We're, I mean, we're definitely going to link all that stuff up. Guys, go, go follow them, like yeah. connect with them. These are people that you want to get to know. These are people that you want to, you know, observe and learn from i mean obviously you know th this is this is the second interview we've done with them and we've probably got three hours recorded you know in total yeah. so this is so this good. is incredible you guys thank you so 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 much for your time thank you for coming on the show again you guys are always a huge blessing and, and we're, so we're, we're better now for sure yes. we got, Maybe guys so. look we'll, we'll all the audience time. oh <laughs> dang it i missed what you said what'd you say no, he said next time, uh, maybe part three or something, we'll record it when we're in a different country. That would be really cool. We're like completely cool. different people when we're in a different country. Let's do that. Part That'd three, awesome. we'll be in another country. And for anyone out there who had, who's tired of hearing about MLM, we won't talk about it in part three, I promise. I part I promise. three will be like, you know, everything that we talked about, because everything we talked about is pretty fresh and new. We're like in the building stages right now. Yeah. So hopefully we can give you some really, I know we will give you some really great results and success of every, of like what, what happens when you leave the comfort zone. So it'll be great to share. Mm -hmm. Let's go guys. Awesome. Look, here's the deal. You've got to go out there and hustle and get it done. You have to, you owe it to your family. You owe it to yourself more so than anyone else. Go out there, get it done. Keep working because we want to have you right here. Uh, where Paul and Michelle are on that screen, interviewing you and telling your story and sharing it to the world because you have no clue who you're going to impact until you get it done. And so, guys, I'm just leaving that with with, with you for now. Uh, we want to see you here. So until that day, come back, keep listening, keep watching, keep learning, but most importantly, keep taking action. And we'll see you on the next episode. Peace. Bye, y'all. Bye, guys. Thank you.
What up, Elite Fan? That's a wrap for today's episode. But look, if you got value out of the show today, do us a huge favor and give us a review or give us a like or subscribe. Do all the things to help us get the word out there. And look, we want to see you on the next show. So get out there and crush it, make it happen. Stay tuned for the next episode. Peace.